Hey, what's going on, everybody? We're live. The Ben Jarofsky Show is just moments away. Oh, I just got a text from Ben. What does it say here? Uh, computer is acting weird. His computer is acting weird. We're going to figure out why his computer is acting weird. The Ben, uh, ben Jarofsky Show uh, will happen in just moments. But first, have you guys heard the new song from Michael Girardi? Yes? No? Can't hear your answer. But you're going to hear it regardless. Here we go. It's called I Want to Be a Centrist. When this song is over... The Ben Jarofsky Show will get started. And are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I want an answer. It's not something you ignore. I think you're 100% full of shit, is what I think. If you think oh, we no want offense, to... No offense, fuck you then. Oh Who are you going to tell me I'm full of shit? There's no centrist in that room. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be a centrist, whatever it takes. Wah, wah. That's the latest from Michael Girardi. You know, every time Girardi sends a new song, I hear it once. I'm like, yeah, that's okay. Then the second time, I'm like, that's pretty good. Then by about time four or five, I'm like, damn, I love this song. No, he's got like a sinister sense of humor. You know, that thing about cutting the baby and I'm going to find that sweet spot. Yeah, I'm right. I'm with you, D. Like, you got to listen to Girardi. Man's telling you something, ladies and gentlemen. You don't want to listen, though. That's the problem. <laughs> All right, everybody, your Ben Jarofsky show for Thursday, April 29th is just moments away. Over 1,000 episodes now, guys. This is episode 1001. Bam! Boom! <laughs> <laughs> it's either we're really good or it's a cry for help. One or the other. Uh, you know, I think it's a blend of both, you know? Okay. <laughs> Somewhere in the gray.
<laughs> we just can't stop, ladies and gentlemen. But episode 1001 of your Ben Jarofsky show for Thursday, April 29th is just moments away. But before we do this, we need to thank our sponsors. Sponsors like SEIU Healthcare, Illinois, Indiana. I want an answer. The Chicago Federation of Labor, <laughs> our sponsors. I want an answer. As well as... Chicago Reader, chicagoreader.com for all things there is to know the city of Chicago, where to go, what to do, what to eat, what to drink, what to smoke. It's true. Chicagoreader.com. Also, how to think politically with columns from Ben Jarofsky, Maya Duke Mosva, and so much more. Chicagoreader.com. Also, chicagoreader.com forward slash Jarofsky. There, not only will you find all 1,000 episodes of the Ben Jarofsky Show, you will also have information on how you can help out the program and become a bin head. Help out the Ben Jarofsky show if you want. If not, it's cool. Just keep listening. Do whatever. But you have three options. You can either be in the alley, the avenue, or the boulevard. Go check it out. ChicagoReader.com forward slash Jarofsky. And also on that page, Ben's latest book, his greatest hits, covering 40 years of Chicago <laughs> journalism, guys. Go check it out. Help out the Ben Jarofsky show in any way you can. And you know you're listening, so you're helping out in that way as well. Ben, should I grab our guest right now? Yes. Excellent. The first guest. Will do. And the Ben Jarofsky Show starts now. It is Thursday, April 29th, and still live from my apartment and his attic, this is the Ben Jarofsky Show. Today on the program, Illinois political know-it-all Jacob Kaplan will join us and Daryl Jones. And now your host, I'd say an Illinois political know-it-all, <laughs> Chicago Reader columnist Ben Jarofsky. Hey, hello everybody, Ben Jarofsky here. We're calling this State of Disunion Thursday. And here's why. Dutifully watched Joe Biden's State of the Union speech last night because that's what a podcaster does. A few observations. One, Joe Biden kept trying to emphasize something that does not exist, and that is partisanship. He kept saying something along the lines of, oh, here's my Joe Biden imitation. We defeated the virus. <laughs> it's actually, I, I, I can't do a Joe Biden invitation. <laughs> well, we, we defeated the virus. I mean, the virus. <laughs> no, but see, that's your imitation of Biden when he's just at a debate talking off the cuff. When he's reading from the prompter, he's actually not bad. Uh, anyway. Uh, uh, <laughs> kept saying things like, we have defeated the virus. We have brought this country back from the brink. We have done it all together. And I'm like, who's the we? <laughs> what country does this guy live in? Because it's not the US of A that I know. Some like half the country doesn't believe the virus was real. Half of them thinks we never should have worn a mask in the first place. They say they're not going to get the vaccine. They think the vaccine is, I don't know, contaminated or something. Plus, like I said, they don't think the pandemic was real. So if it's not real, why get vaccinated? Meanwhile, they want to continue to congregate in large groups without masks. You got Tucker Carlson saying, we should call the cops on people who put masks on their children. Which by the way, if I might point this out, is a little counter to the general MAGA attitude regarding liberty. Follow me on this. MAGA says, you cannot be thrown in jail for not wearing a mask. Okay, but what about the kids? Because they have a constitutional right not to wear a mask, but you can be thrown in for having your child wear a mask. Well, what about the kids' constitutional right to wear a mask? So there's a constitutional right not to wear a mask, but no constitutional right to wear a mask. Constitutional rights for me, not for thee. Come on, MAGA, get your act together. At least try to act consistent. By the way, I don't, know if, I don't know if you noticed this. The state of Florida is prohibiting cruise vessels from asking passengers to show proof that they got the vaccine. No vaccine passports for MAGA because they're anti-liberty and liberty matters. Unless, of course, you're the aforementioned parent of the aforementioned kid who will get thrown into jail for wearing a mask. Now I'm trying to understand 
Why would MAGA care if cruise vessels require people to show that they got the vaccine, to which MAGA says, Ben, because that would say they discriminate against people who don't want to get the vaccine. But so what? Isn't the whole point to encourage people to get the vaccine, to stop the spread of the virus, so you can do things like go on a big cruise boat with hundreds of other people sitting face-to-face in the dining room? If that's what they got, it's not much. Meanwhile, in his rebuttal to Joe Biden, Senator Tim Scott gave all the credit to ending the virus to Donald Trump. He said it was Trump who spearheaded the creation and the distribution of the vaccine. They even gave Trump a name for it, Operation Warp Speed. Now let's hold on. If the virus wasn't real, why give Trump credit for stopping it? You can't stop something that does not exist. And if the vaccine isn't necessary, why give Trump credit for creating it, since there was no need for it in the first place? On the other hand, if, as Tim Scott asserts, the vaccine has saved America by killing the virus, then why is Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida banning cruise ships for mandating that passengers passengers have to take the vaccine? Man, MAGA is all over the place with this one. How can we have bipartisanship between Democrats and Republicans we don't, when we don't even have bipartisanship between Ron DeSantis and Tim Scott? Here's what's going on. When Tim Scott gives Donald Trump credit for, quote unquote, saving us from the virus. He's throwing a bone to the proverbial swing voter in suburban Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and DuPage County. The voters who are ready to vote Republican because they love tax breaks, but feel a little uncomfortable being in the same party with a bunch of wingnuts who think the virus doesn't exist and we don't need the vaccine. So you got Scott talking about how Trump took the pandemic seriously, even though he didn't. And it's Scott's way of saying we're not wing nuts, even though, as Ron DeSantis shows, they really are. What else? Oh, yes, back to the bipartisanship. Tim Scott was furious that Biden didn't propose programs that Republicans support, as if they support anything he proposed. Listen, President Obama played that game, always talking bipartisanship. There are no red states. There are no blue states, only the United States. And what did the Republicans do? They hit him over the head with a map of the United States. Not one vote for Obama's health care plan, even though it was the same thing that Mitt Romney put through in Massachusetts when he was governor. Couldn't even get Congressman Aaron Schock from Illinois to vote for it. Gave him a ride on the presidential plan and everything. And then the Republicans spent the better part of the decade hammering Obama with Obamacare as though it was the first step toward Bolshevism. So forget that. Biden's going it alone, going to try to keep that 50-vote coalition together long enough to pass $6 trillion worth of social programs, infrastructure, daycare, free community college, everything that everyone wants, but Republicans have to say they're against. Why? Because Biden has proposed it, and they have to be against anything that Biden proposes as they wage their unrelenting cultural war against the Democrats, because that's the only way they know how to run a campaign, and that's the way they think they can win back the House, the Senate, and the White House. You got to love Biden's strategy. He holds the party together. He ignores the opposition. He passes what he can, and he pretends he cares about bipartisanship. Finally! A Democrat who plays the game like a Republican. We got a great show today, everybody. Jacob Kaplan, speaking of Democrats, I'm looking at him right now, is with us from the Cook County Democratic Party. He's going to explain <laughs> the uh, redistricting process in the state of Illinois in the days after the census came out. We lost the congressional seat. What does that mean? And then uh, Daryl Jones will join us from the Transformative Justice Coalition, promoting the John Lewis Day of Action on May 8th. Uh, he's out of Washington. We talk a little bit about making D.C. a state, something that Democrats, speaking of things that the Democrats should do with uh, as long as they control the Senate and the House, hurry up, do it now before the 2022 midterms, which we may no longer hold the House and the Senate. But anyway, uh, Daryl Jones uh, will be with us. I say we bring Jacob Kaplan on right now. Why take a break? Let's bring Jacob Kaplan on right now. I'm looking at the man. The man's sitting there. He's fired up. Jacob. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Ben. 
All right. I reached out to you immediately. I think it was um, Tuesday. The days are just coming together when I was reading my beloved Bright One and the Tribune about how the state of Illinois was going to lose one congressional seat. The census had come out, the first uh, installment, I guess, of the census had come out, and uh, we had enough information to know that relative to the rest of the states of the Union, Illinois' population had fallen. Henceforth, it was going to lose a congressional seat. What does that mean? I said, I'm reaching out to Jacob Kaplan, who has memorized the rule book when it comes to uh, redistricting. Uh, So, Jacob, take us through this a little bit. Uh, it literally, what does it mean? What will, who will be drawing the map? When will they be drawing the map? Uh, and, uh, how can Democrats act in a way that preserves democratic seats and screws over Republicans? Go ahead, take it away. Sure. So, uh, every 10 years we have to redraw the, uh, you know, the, the, all of our districts, including the congressional districts. And of course, as you alluded to the census came out with its figures early, uh, earlier this week, uh, saying that Illinois has lost one uh, congressional seat because every ten years the census has to determine uh, how we split up our 435 congressional seats among the states. So uh, Illinois up till now had 17 congressional seats. Now we'll have 16. Uh, I think that's honestly good news. I think there were some predicting we might lose two seats. So just losing one, I think, is the best outcome we could have hoped for. Uh, So what happens next is that the Illinois legislature at some point this year has to redraw uh, the congressional district map. And uh, the one thing is that the legislature is waiting for is more specific data, uh, kind of the block level census data on uh, where people live exactly, uh, because that'll allow them to be more exact in how they draw the districts. Now there's questions of when that data is going to come out exactly and maybe using some alternative data in the meantime, but regardless, uh, the maps will be redrawn at some point uh, this year. Uh, the congressional uh, maps, there's no specific deadline, unlike the state legislative maps, which have to be drawn by June 30th. The congressional maps can be drawn at any time, but I presume that the legislature is going to want to get this done uh, well before uh, or right around the time petitions begin circulating for the 2022 election, which will be uh, right around Labor Day. So. My assumption is that come August, uh, we'll we'll have a good sense of what's going to happen with our uh, congressional uh, district map. Um, Now, what's going to happen since we're losing one seat? Uh, I presume that since the Democrats are in control of both houses of the legislature and, of course, the governor's uh, seat as well, that we will probably draw out one of the Republican districts downstate. Uh, Would love it uh, if Mary Miller got drawn out personally. (laughs) I think that would be... uh, Perfect. Draw her in with some one of the other downstate Dems, Rodney Davis, or, or you name it. Um, but I think no matter what, the Democrats in Springfield are going to want to save all of the Democratic seats we have so far. So there's going to be an effort to draw out one of the downstate Dems. And, you know, there's some interesting ideas where we could even potentially draw a downstate, you know, district that uh, could finally elect a Democrat again, like the Rodney Davis seat, which is uh, includes some of Metro East, St. Louis, Alton, parts of Alton, and parts of uh, the college towns of, uh, I believe, uh, Bloomington and some other uh, cities was drawn to elect a Democrat, and we've never been able to do it. So if we draw out one of those Republican seats downstate, we can kind of pack more Democrats into a downstate district. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but it's kind of one of my thoughts is, could we actually uh, draw a Democratic district in downstate Illinois once again uh, while we're screwing uh the Republic. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, that's that's what's going to happen. I don't think, you know, we, we don't know yet how this is exactly going to play out. But uh, at some point later this year, we'll 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 get a sense of it. All right. I'm going to pretend I'm an editorial writer for the Chicago Sun-Times uh, or the Chicago Tribune or a member of some do-gooder group uh, in downtown Chicago. Um, Jacob, it's really partisan of you. Uh, to talk about screwing over Republicans. We should be viewing a fair map. We should be putting together a fair map. Partisan, not partisan, but bipartisan, working together. That's the ideal. Come on, Jacob. That's what we should be working toward. That was my imitation of a Sun-Times editorial. Yep. (laughs) We should have... (laughs) I'm like, what planet are you guys on? (laughs) I know. And I'm just being my, I'm, I got my partisan hat on as executive director of the Democratic Party here in Cook County. I, I want to elect as many, keep as many Democrats in Congress as possible. And I think until 
you know, if all the Republican states decide they want to go to independent commissions, then sure, we can get on board with that. If Congress at some point wants to pass a law saying that all states have to redistrict based on independent commissions, then sure, let's do that. But at this point, with all these Republican states uh, that are going to be gerrymandering things even more to to screw Democrats, for lack of a better word, I think we in Illinois, in a solid blue state, have to do what we have to elect as many Democrats as possible from our state. So I hate to say that, but that's what we're, no. that's the, the partisan world we're in right now. Yes. I wouldn't even say I hate to say it. <laughs> <laughs> well, ideally, we would all work yeah. together and we could, you know, I that's mean, true. bipartisanship is something to, uh, that'd be great to have, but we just don't have it right now. That's true. So, that's true. That's true. That's a valid point. I just, I, I had this moment of irritation, I must confess. And I love the indivisible people. They're my favorite people in the world. I love indivisible. But whenever I hear the indivisible is welcome, like a fair map person, you know, I'm like, where's the Republican group in Wisconsin that has welcomed a fair map person? And the indivisible, but Ben, you have to be open-minded and listen to what people say. Why? You're listening to people that would want to cut your throat, politically speaking. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, no, I just want to hear what they have to say. I'm like, where are the Republicans in Michigan listening to the fair map people? You know, why is it only Democrats that <laughs> open minds? We're going to listen to everybody. Please explain that to me, Jacob. I mean, it's 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 true. There aren't any Republicans that are going to do that. I mean, again, like you said, it's Wisconsin, Michigan, Texas, North Carolina. When they start drawing their maps in a fair way, then we can do it as well. But, it, you know, people make this argument, oh, we should lead by example. But I'm sorry, we're just in a, <laughs> we're in a partisan war right now. That's the environment out here. And uh, we can't just say, OK, we're going to let up and let people do it, do whatever they want here. And, you know, and the other thing is, honestly, People say, oh, we can draw, you know, a, you know, a more fair map, but Illinois is still a dem very democratic state. It's not like you, you know, even if, even if it was drawn by an independent commission, I don't think it would honestly differ that much from the map that uh, the Democrats end up drawing. Maybe we have one less Democrat in the, in Congress or something like that, but you know, the city of Chicago, the suburbs, the collar counties, they're all solidly democratic now, which it didn't used to be. So mm -hmm. it's, the facts that we're going to be, we're going to have a lot of Democratic congressional districts no matter what here. So, but the bottom line is we have to milk everything we can out of uh, the map and uh, elect as many Democrats as we can so we can keep a hold of the House in 2022. By the way, uh, for further discussion on what the Republicans are up to around the country when it comes to election law, uh, after Jacob is on, we're going to bring on uh, Daryl Jones from the Transformative Justice uh, Coalition. We're going to break down what's happening in states like uh, uh, Georgia and Texas and Florida. So just so you, you good-natured, good-hearted Democrats in Illinois realize what you're up against. OK, just like an alternative view to what you'll read, like in Cranes or uh, Chicago Tribune or the Chicago, even my beloved bright one, the Chicago Sun-Times, they, they've been drinking that weird Kool-Aid. Uh, all right. Um, so let's uh, put on your pundit hat for a moment. And, uh, you know, it seems like every Republican congressman is looking at this redistricting with an eye toward uh, the 2022 gubernatorial race or the senatorial race, following this Jacobs. In other words, if they get uh, cut out of their district or if they get put into a, a district with another uh, Republican, then they're like holding open the possibility uh, that they would run for um, governor or senator. Adam Kinzinger finally came out and said this at in an uh, interview he did with Laura Washington and Lynn Sweet on the on their show. He said, yeah, he would think about it if uh, he um, was uh, redistricted. Tactically, in your humble opinion, what's the best strategy Democrats could pursue in terms of avoiding the toughest challenger to J.B. Pritzker or Tammy Duckworth in 2022? That's a good question. I mean, I, I think Adam Kinziger, if I were the Democrats, I'd leave his district in place because number one, I think it's just a good thing to have a voice like him in Congress as a, I, you know, he's certainly not a moderate Republican, but he's not a crazy Trump Republican. He's one of the few. Also, I don't think if, you know, he does get drawn out, I think he'd have a real tough time running in a Republican primary and winning because it's become the party of Trump. So if, even if he decides to run for governor or something, I don't think he's going to succeed. And may, maybe you say, OK, well, then why don't we draw him out? I just but again, I think it's better to keep his voice uh, in Congress. I think that's that's something that. Uh, 
that just makes sense to me. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, if you draw, like, let's say we draw Mary Miller and Rodney Davis into the same district or something like that, I mean, and, and one of them decides to run for, sec you know, for Secretary of State or Governor or Senate, and don't forget, there's all sorts of other statewide offices up, Attorney General, Comptroller, Treasurer. I mean, so there's there's a lot of statewide offices that we haven't heard people from the Republicans on who's going to run for them yet. So, uh, I mean, I think no matter what, you, you're going to see some of these downstate uh, Republicans, you know, one of them's going to get drawn out. They're probably going to run for one of those seats. And but I, I still think in a in 2022, in a midterm election, you would say normally it's a disadvantage for, uh, you know, for, for the party in power, the Democrats. But I think Republicans are going to nominate uh somebody nutty for a lot of these offices and I don't think they're going to be successful. So I don't, I just don't think we need to worry too much about, you know, we put this person into this district and they're going to run for governor. I don't know. I, I don't see that being too much as Democrats that we need to worry about downstate. Maybe I'm wrong. Do you see any attempt by Republicans? Maybe I'm, I missed something to sort of moderate their uh, worldview in any way. Uh, I know that they were sort of trying to do that kind of with Tim Scott's speech yesterday, uh, in re the rebuttal to Biden. I talked about it already uh, in my opening. Uh, that was kind of a, a, a weak, <laughs> in my humble opinion, uh, moderation. If you, if you know what I'm saying, like the moderate point of view, yeah. you know, he was so cautious about straying from the MAGA line uh, on many issues, but he threw out that as I said, like he tried to make it seem like the Republicans were serious about the pandemic, even though, of course, they're not. Do you see in the state of Illinois any attempt by Republicans uh, to moderate their point of view? No, <laughs> I, re I really don't. I mean, who is the moderate Republican that's that's uh, that's going to that's going to run for 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 governor or anything like that? I mean, I, I just don't see it. I, don't, I mean, it's it would, it would make sense for them to do it because I think that's the only way if, if you don't nominate a, a moderate, I don't think you're going to win statewide, even in a midterm. But and so a smart Republican Party in Illinois would be like, Ann McKenzie, let's do it. Let's pave the way for you. Let's get you in there as a, you know, as the Republican nominee against Pritzker. But I don't think that's going to happen. I, I don't think that the Republican base goes for that. I mean, mm -hmm. this, this Republican base is going to turn out in the primary in March of next year. I just think they're. You know, it's 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 not the Republican Party of even ten years ago in this state. But and let me just point out when we say moderate, it's in quotes, because uh, I'm just thinking of our good friend Heidi Henry, who's uh, out in Kinsinger's district, and points out whenever she's on the show and on her own uh, podcast, the Heartland Mamas, that Adam Kinsinger is very much a conservative Republican on virtually every single issue that exists, except the issue of whether Donald Trump should be treated as the emperor of the United States. Because he says he does not believe in Donald Trump as the emperor of the United States, he ha is considered, a, and I'm putting it in quotes, a moderate. That's what moderate has become in the Republican Party, Jacob. You don't find, I can't think of any Republican, correct me if I'm wrong, any Republican who is like, for instance, pro-choice. Uh, I'm trying to think of a Republican who's for the legalization of marijuana on a national level. I'm trying to think of a Republican uh, who would endorse uh, progressive taxation, a higher rate on the wealthier people. Just these just issues that you could perhaps, how about a Republican that believes in climate change? You know, that man has an impact on, yeah. <laughs> on the earth's environment. I, I can't think of a Republican right now that fits that category. And so I just, I'm just saying that when we use the term moderate right now, we have moved so far to um, the right that it almost has no meaning, uh, at least in relation to the past. Do you agree? I do. I mean, who are the moderates anymore? I mean, I guess in the Senate, it's you can Mitt Romney, Lisa Murkowski. I mean, but they're still incredibly conservative. The only thing is they'll actually work to a degree with Democrats. But even then, a lot of them won't vote for uh, you know Democratic initiatives. So I, I don't think you, you certainly don't have uh, any moderates like like we had again even ten years ago. They were they've all been driven out of the party. Yeah, I remember when um, what was it? Tom Cross was going to run statewide as a uh, Republican for what was it? Treasure? I have lost track of 2014. Yeah. 2014. Yeah. Uh, and he felt compelled to support 
the um, gay marriage initiative. They immediately left the legislature after he did that because he was running statewide. So he figured I had a he would have to be a little more moderate. There's nothing like that right now. He actually um, almost won. I mean, that went to a recount. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's a smart thing to do in the state. But again, I don't think the Republican base goes for that. So yeah. And the Republic MAGA controls the Republican Party. All right, before we let you go, uh, just general thoughts. We, we've been talking about the uh, the impact of the redistricting on congressional seats. Now, obviously, they're going to be redrawing the legislative uh, districts and the Supreme Court. The districts for the Supreme Court uh, will be redrawn. What's the process and the procedure for the state offices? Well, those, just like the uh, congressional map, have to be passed by both houses of the legislature and signed by the governor. Uh, the Constitution does require the legislative maps technically to be done by June 30th, but I think there's some workarounds that lawyers are working on now if the data isn't in yet by that point. Uh, I think there's some backup plans. Uh, you mentioned the Supreme Court. The I don't think the Illinois Supreme Court districts have been redrawn in something like 50 years. So that isn't required to be redrawn every 10 years. And maybe some other time we can get into the uh, nutty world of judicial districts and judicial politics. But I do think that from what I hear, there's uh, an effort to uh, redraw some of these downstate and suburban uh, Illinois Supreme Court districts because, again, they haven't been redrawn in like 50 years. So that's something new that we haven't done in anybody's uh, memory, basically. Um, but all this stuff just has to be passed through the state and signed by the governor. All right, very good. Jacob Kaplan, thank you so much for coming on the show. My next guest, uh, Daryl Jones, has joined us. We're going to bring him, we're going to take a break and bring him on. Jacob, be well. Talk to you soon, all right? Thanks for having me, Ben. Take care. When, when we return, Daryl Jones from the Transformative Justice Coalition, talking about May 8th, talking about, you know what? I may ask him to give a rebuttal to Tim Scott. I just popped, I've been just, I've been reading about Tim Scott's speech. I watched it again. I've watched it twice now. I, I, I've almost memorized it. You know, so uh, we may uh, ask uh, Daryl to do that. Uh, we'll be right back with Daryl Jones. And now, the list of things that you can buy at the Chicago Reader store at chicagoreader.com. Things to wear like Chicago Reader hats, t-shirts, bandanas, and face masks. Things for your daily life like the Chicago Reader camping mug, Chicago Reader tote bags, and a Chicago Reader reporter's notebook. Things for you to read like our Reader recipes, the Chicago Reader 420 Companion, our Chicago Reader Best of book series from journalists Maya Duke Masaba, Mike Sula, Ben Jarofsky, and Lior Galil, the Chicago Reader coloring book, and the Chicago Reader stay home puzzle. Find the Chicago Reader store at chicagoreader.com and show your support for the nation's first free weekly news newspaper since 1971. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, good afternoon, Madam Mayor. Welcome back to the Ben Jarofsky Show, live from his attic. Yes, that was uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, but uh, we're not talking local politics right now. We're talking national politics. Uh, and with me uh, from Washington, Daryl Jones from the Transformative Justice Coalition. Uh, welcome to the show, Daryl. Thanks for coming on. Thanks so much, Ben. It's such a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to a good conversation. Yes. Uh, let's get uh, some things out of the way first. We talked locally a couple days ago about what's going on in Chicago area, May 8th. Uh, and uh, why don't you just give sort of a rundown nationally, what is happening on May 8th, uh, why, uh, what the, the goals are, and what are some of the actions that people should know about. So take it away, Daryl. Thanks, Ben. Thanks so much. <clears throat> you know, uh, May 8th, uh, what I want your listeners to do right now is to go to John Lewis dayofaction.org, John Lewis, dayofaction.org, May the 8th. May the 8th is the day that we have designated that around this country, we are going to have voter caves, 
that are going to bring awareness to the importance of H.R. 1 S. 1, which is the For the People Act. And what that does in essence is it levels the playing field when it comes to uh, being able to access the right to vote throughout America. And so on May the 8th, we want everyone from around the country to come together. We're going to have voter cades. We started out with 100 voter cades in 100 plus cities. We're now at over 125 voter cades throughout 125 different cities throughout America, including four that are going on in the city of Chicago. So we're all over the place. But it's not just, it is not just HR1 and S1, the For the People Act, which levels the playing field for rights to vote and, and requirements to vote. It's also HR4. HR4 is the, uh, is the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. That's, we call that the bookend, right? The uh, HR1, S1 levels the playing field, saying that everybody has to have the same uh, accessibility to be able to vote. H.R. 4 is the one that requires the preclearance that says if you are implementing a law that has a uh, disparate impact against uh, African Americans, Asian Americans, people of color, that it has to be pre-cleared before it can go in place so that we don't have incidents like we're having in Florida and Texas and Georgia and Ohio. All around the country, we have all these different pieces of voter suppressive legislation. So May the 8th is the day that we have selected to uh, let Congress know that the people of the United States, the, pe the Americans that are here that are voters, are saying, we know what's up. We know what's up. Pass the For the People Act, H.R. 1, S. 1. The other reason that May 8th is also important, Ben, is that we know now that on May the 11th, the Congress is going in to do markup on the H.R. 1, S. 1, For the People Act bill. We also know that during that weekend of May 8th, they're on recess, so they're home. They're in Chicago. They're in Dallas. That's why we're doing it on May 8th. So that Saturday, we're going past the, uh, the federal building, past the, the House, if there's a House, one of the members that's there, letting them see the people coming out and saying, don't mess with our vote. Hands off our vote. Make it all equal across this nation. That's what May 8th is all about. And we encourage everybody to go to John Lewis dayofaction.org. Take a look. You can sign up to be involved in our next tell town hall, which is going to be on Wednesday. You can, uh, we have a map there at the John Lewis uh, dayofaction.org website. We have a map there that has all the voter cades going on across the nation. You can click on the bubble that is your state, that is your voter cade, and it will bring you to the link to be able to sign up and get more information with the, with the voter cades in Chicago, the voter cades in Detroit, we even have a voter, Kate, have been in Hawaii, okay? We're all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great riff, by the way. Um, John Lewis, of course, is the former congressman uh, from Georgia, the great civil rights leader uh, who uh, led marchers in 1965, long before Daryl Jones was born. 1965, he led marchers uh, uh, to confront Alabama state troopers at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Folks, if you're too young to have lived through it, you at least saw the movie. And you know what the state troopers did? They whacked him over the head because he was insisting that black people have the right to vote in the South. How outrageous of him. And so what happened, Daryl Jones, I'm just gonna go on my riff, what happened is that after a while, Republicans go, you know, maybe we shouldn't criticize uh, John Lewis because it would look like we're anti Martin Luther King. You know, now that Martin Luther King's conveniently out of the way. Anyway, it looks like we're anti Martin Luther King. Well, as soon as the great John Lewis dies, what do they do? They try to undo absolutely everything he was doing on that bridge back in 1965. It's unbelievable. I cannot believe I've lived long enough to see it happen, Daryl Jones. One, the great civil rights movement that forced the change. Now two, the backlash. And why don't you explain a little bit for our listeners how that backlash is being played out in states like Georgia and Florida and Texas, just in case there's any of my listeners who out, out there believe that Republicans really are bipartisan in terms of reaching out uh, to all people. What other states about Michigan, Wisconsin? Go ahead. Take it away, okay. Daryl Jones. You can, you can continue with the list, Ben. You're doing great. You're doing great. <laughs> you know? and, and I'll tell you, 
do not segregate it to just the South because it's not just the South, right? Wisconsin's not the South, okay? It's not just the South. Don't get confused in thinking that it's just the South. But what's, this is what we do know that has happened at these state legislatures across the country. We know that down in Georgia, we were down in Georgia for the Georgia Senate runoff. Uh, uh, we were the Transforming Ju uh, Justice Coalition, and Barbara Arnwine and I uh, were down there. We were rallying people up. We were getting the John Lewis votercades up. We had 25 different votercades going on across the state of uh, Georgia. We took it to the point that at the end of our votercades, as with the votercades that will be happening on May the 8th, at the end of the votercades in Georgia, we would have a celebration village. And at this voter celebration village, we celebrated the right to vote. We gave food out. We gave drinks out. You know, we gave coats out because it was a it was a food desert in parts of southern Georgia. So they couldn't, uh, they didn't have access to food. So after they voted, or even if they didn't vote, they could come on over to the celebration village and have a piece of fried fish or have, a, you know, whatever it was that, that, that was being served and have a drink of water, an iced tea, and things like that. Well, you know, uh, uh, Rappersberger, the, the Secretary of State there in Georgia, got wind of what we were doing and saw these great voter turnouts coming from these minority, uh, historically minor, uh, disproportionately minority communities. They were coming out. They were coming out in numbers. They were following the voter case because the voter case went to a polling place. And at, once we got there, we told them, go in and vote. And they go in and vote. So this is what they saw happening across the state of Georgia. So what did Rappersberger do? He said, you know what? We're issuing a proclamation. If I see anybody giving anyone in line, any voter, as much as a glass of milk, no, he said, a cup of coffee, we're going to lock you up. And what did we say? Lock us up because we're on the side of righteousness. So what happened from that? The Georgia legislature now has gone back into session following the success of the voter turnout, the numbers that came out from the Georgia runoff election. And they've implemented all these suppressive voter legislation laws. They've been, they, they uh, tried to change the, or have changed the absentee ballots so that, you know, you gotta have two IDs to do the absentee and you gotta run off a copy of your ID and you gotta send it in. And then, you know, they, they go beyond that. They, uh, what I told you about us giving the folks uh, coats and food and stuff, they said, uh-uh, no more, we're banning it. We're banning it. You give them pizza, pizza, you're going to jail. You give them a cup of water, you're going to jail. You tell that old lady to stand in line by herself and be thirsty. It's unfortunate that she doesn't have water to take her pills, but that's unfortunate. You just stand in line and you just wait. That's just crazy. But that's what Georgia was doing. One of the other things they did in Georgia that was just so incredibly offensive, the state of Georgia, particularly Fulton County, I believe it was, was able to purchase from their own funds a mobilization van. Their mobilization van would go around their county to different sites and people could vote at the van. Mm. They could vote at the van. The whole thing was already set, and I'm sure it was a couple hundred thousand of the cost for it, right? An RV type vehicle. They could go there and vote. And it would go from park to park where they knew people would be to make it easy and accessible for people to vote. Vote. What did the Georgia legislature do? They banned it. They made it illegal. <laughs> we don't want our people to vote. No. Come on now. And then they were trying to restrict the, uh, restrict the drop boxes. They wanted the drop boxes, the drop boxes to be inside of a place and only be accessible nine to five. That's not the purpose of the drop box. It's 24 hours to make it easy for people to get to. So that's what the Georgia legislature was doing. So not to be outdone, Florida had to get into the game. Florida gets into the game and they start doing the same crazy stuff that Georgia was doing. They're trying to out Georgia, Georgia on suppressing the vote. And so they do stupid things. They end the 24 seven uh, 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 hour access to drop boxes. That's what Florida does. They go and they say, you know what? We don't want our people to have food in line either. So they say no food or drink around <laughs> for people that are in line uh, in Florida. This is incredible. And then Florida says, well, you know what? That whole vote by mail thing, we don't want you to just be able to access that once. So every election cycle, you need to request it again, rather than every other election cycle, which they have been doing previously. Just crazy stuff. Oh, by the way, uh, if you want food and drink, because you know they probably heard me when I was talking about the poor little old lady that couldn't take the medicine and needed a drink of water, they said, oh, well, um, our election officials are the only people that can give you a glass of water or something to eat uh, for our voters. That's it. So we're going to uh, require, uh, uh, allow the election official to do that. 
Oh, come on now. <laughs> They're having difficulty finding election officials. They're having difficulty finding poll workers. So what do they do? They give them more responsibility. Come on, it does not make sense. That is simply ridiculous. But that's what Florida uh, had done. Let's not talk about Texas. My goodness, the great <laughs> state of Texas and that boot. What did they do? They saw Harris County turning out and they were like, oh, wait a minute. All this 24 hour voting and being able to vote from your car, we're going to stop that. No, no, y'all voting too much. You're not voting, you're voting too much. We're going to stop you. Harris County happens to be, uh, and let me put it in my words, the black county in Texas, okay? Yeah. It's a heavily black and brown county that's in the state of Texas, and they're trying to stop them, and they uh, have passed a law to stop them from having uh, outlawing their 24-hour voting. It's just incredible. And it, there's samples like that that have gone across this country. But the big thing, Ben, is that May the 8th, what the HR1 and S1 does, it levels all of that out. Because had... Uh, HR 4 been in place, had uh, HR 1, the For the People Act S1 been in place, these states wouldn't have been able to impact, uh, wouldn't able been able to uh, put in place these restrictive laws, these suppressive voting laws. They wouldn't exempt. What we would be talking about today, you and I today would be talking about how the bulls are going to fall right behind the wizards <laughs> and try to get into the playoffs. That's what we would be talking about today. But instead, we have to stay here and talk about how difficult <laughs> it is for black, brown, and people of color to be able to vote. So you know, we invite you, to, we want everyone to come on out on, on May the 8th. Go to that johnlewisdayofaction.org website and get yourself signed up and, and come on out there and let's represent. Okay, I am going to let that little dig at my beloved Bulls pass. <laughs> Daryl Jones is so excited because his little Wizards won. Like, they beat the Lakers last night. They haven't stopped talking about it since. I just want to remind them that LeBron James didn't play. But what Wizards fans, I've already heard from two of them today. This is the third one I've heard from. Ben, we won last night. We beat the Lakers. All right, I'm gonna, but I'm going to let it pass, Daryl Jones. I'm just going to move on. I'm going to stay focused. Got to stay focused, okay? <laughs> now, look. I hear you. And you're right. It's not just the South. Let me apologize to all my listeners in Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, Texas. It's not just the South. Michigan, Wisconsin. I think those Republicans in Pennsylvania. These are all union states, by the way. Uh, they're all up to no good. Now, I got to ask you this one. Get your response to this. Whenever you, anybody points out that these new laws that Republican legislators are passing throughout the country uh, in the aftermath of having lost in November, uh, whenever anybody points out that these are targeted toward black voters, which I believe personally, they, that's my personal belief, they are targeted black voters. They try to throw, talk about Michigan Daryl Jones, they try to throw out Detroit. It doesn't get much more targeted than that. Hey, here's how we're going to win the election. We're not going to let people in Detroit vote. All right. Whenever I say that, some Republican, in fact, Senator Tim Scott said it last night. Well, Ben, you don't understand. We're just f emulating the law that they passed in New York. <laughs> the New York law. Suddenly, they want to be like New York. They trash the hell out of everything yeah. New New York has ever done and talk about blue state. But all of a sudden, you know, they're emulating New York. Your response to the Republican uh, counterattack. Go ahead, Daryl Jones. You know, Ben, I, I'm nonpartisan. I'm a non nonpartisan organization, so I, I, I don't look at party affiliation. I look at philosophical belief and, and the impact that it has uh, on uh, on society and particularly on, on voters. When you raise the name Tim Scott, uh, I, I think South Carolina. When I think South Carolina, I, I think of one of the, the more racist areas that you'll find in America. And so, you know, for instance, it, it, it's the whole dichotomy of, of what these conservative philosophers put out and when they're trying to address voting rights, when they say that it's not about race, there's a race neutral reason. And, and all of this you know, jive that they, they throw out and trying to put that in place. But the problem that I have, and, and I'm gonna lift Tim Scott up as the example, okay? I wanna lift up just for a moment, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, all right? That, that's race 
base, that, that foundationally race base, much of the arguments that are being made with regards to what's happening in voting. So Tim Scott, Senator Scott, says that he has a plan that he's putting together that he wants them to consider for policing in America to address the issue. He comes on last night and he says what? There's no racism in America. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, why are you putting together the plan if there's no racism in America? <laughs> right, right. That's what it's all about. So if using that, using that as the example of what's being applied on the voting rights, come on now. Come on. Let's, it doesn't even, it, it's, it's inconsistent internally. So philosophically inconsistent. So all the stuff they're trying to say that it's, you know, it, it just so happens that uh, uh, we're closing the, the, the polling sites that are in the black and brown and uh, communities. And, and, you know, and, and they're just going to have to be able to travel someplace else to go to a polling place. It may be five or six more miles away, and they may not have vehicles in there. Uh, uh, there's not on a bus route. But, you know, it's not intended to have a racial impact. It just happens to have that impact. Come on. No, no, not buying it, not for a moment, not for a second. That, that's what May 8th is all about. The whole John Lewis Advancement Act, the whole concept of what we're doing on May 8th is about that, is leveling that playing field. You know, Reverend Jackson, uh, who, you know, I, I, I've just, you know, really become, you know, just really close to him and, and had an opportunity to, to continually speak with him, one of the things that he points out is that if the loving, if the playing field is level and the rules are transparent and the officiating is fair, we can live with the results. That's all we're saying. That's what that's what the that's what the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act is saying. That's what HR1 and S1 is saying. Level it all out. Whoever wins, wins. But level it out. Let's have that level playing field. So anything that I see that goes forward to tilting that level playing field, flags go off, mm -hmm. lights go off, bells go off. There's a problem. There's a problem. Let the voters vote. Make it easy for them to vote. That's what HR1 and S1 does. HR1 and S1 would make it easy for people to register to vote because they can register wherever they go for their driver's license. They can register at any government building. And, it, it addresses all of the issues, both rural as well as urban, that are encountered. And let me make this one last point, if I, if I may, Ben. When it comes to HR1 and S1, do you know who wrote the first 300 pages of that bill? John Lewis. John Lewis wrote the first 300 pages of the bill. This is the reason we're getting behind this. This, this is the reason that we need it passed, not simply because John Lewis's name on it, but because he's bigger than his name. He is voting rights in America. So, you know, we encourage everyone to come out on May the 8th and, su and support the voter caves that are going on uh, throughout the country. There'll be the celebration villages where they're in. There'll be a little teach-ins that go on to talk about H.R. 1, H.R. 51, D.C. statehood, as well as H.R. 4. All of that's going to be covered. And, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, watching. You know, if you're concerned because of COVID, we have different levels of participation that are there. Now, go to that johnlewisdayofaction.org website, and what you'll see is that uh, if you want to be out with the people and you're, and you're comfortable being out with the people, you can be out with the people, marching with the people, a beautiful banner about, uh, that will be in front of you leading you on. If you're not comfortable because of COVID restrictions or what, that, what may be, you'll be in your vehicle. You're in your vehicle. You're part of a motorcade in your vehicle. You don't have to leave your vehicle for anything. The, the teaching at the Celebration Village will be in your vehicle. They'll bring food to you in your vehicle. So, you know, that's the se second level of protection. And the third level of protection is this. If you go to the, the Facebook, to Transformative Justice uh, Coalition, you can watch the entire national broadcast and all of the voter cases across the uh, country uh, virtually, watching it on Facebook Live, IG Live. It'll be available to you. So whatever your level of comfort is, it's there. Whatever your level of comfort, COVID level is, it's there. Mm -hmm. But we encourage everyone to get involved, uh, involved and uh, participate in that May 8th day of action. And, you know, Ben, one thing I haven't said, and, and, and I came close to saying it, you know, talking about Tim Scott, you know, you know, I, I, I think about, you know, Lindsey Graham with a black face and hearing that voice. That's, that's pretty much, you know, 
what what it is when you're saying there's no racism in America that's just covering it up. But I will not go there. I will not say that. I'm glad I didn't go that far. So, <laughs> I encourage folks to come out on May the 8th to participate with us in these John Lewis Day of Action uh, activities. Okay. All right, that was really well done. Uh, you're not going to go there. You stay where you're not going to go, and then you say you're not going to go there. That was really well done. Um, all right, now, <clears throat> uh, let me say this. Uh, Daryl Jones uh, is very, made it very clear uh, that he is nonpartisan uh, in his worldview. I, on the other hand, as a talk show host on a podcast, I'm very partisan. So I am distinguishing myself from Daryl Jones. Let me just say this. All of these initiatives to quote unquote reform election law happened in the aftermath of the presidential election 2020 when the Republicans lost. And we go back to Georgia, they lost by a little more than 11,000 votes. Donald Trump himself, President Donald Trump got on the phone with Georgia state election officials and said, find me the 11,000 whatever it was votes I need. So he made it clear what he was up to. In the aftermath of their refusal, and I give them credit, the bar is low, Daryl Jones, but I give them credit for refusing to commit election fraud by literally reaching into a ballot box, picking up 12,000 black votes and throwing them away. Okay, so, you know, the bar is low, but I give them credit for that. That was that same state official that you just alluded to that got outraged because some senior citizen was drinking a bottle of water in a line in the heat. So in the aftermath of that, Daryl Jones, that's when we saw, instead of the Tim Scotts of the world saying to black people in Georgia or South Carolina or Florida, let me listen to you. What can I say? How can we change the Republican Party to win your support? How can we maybe propose like an affirmative action program or more funding for black schools? Whatever, whatever it's going to take, Daryl Jones, instead of saying, how can I move my party to where you are? What he says is, you know what? We're just not going to let you vote. That's how we're going to win the next election. So this is very much, this is me speaking, not Daryl Jones. This is very much a partisan attack. They made up a problem that didn't exist, which is election fraud. No, no evidence whatsoever, Daryl Jones. And you're a lawyer. You got to go into court before you go before a judge. You got to prove whatever you're going to say. No evidence whatsoever. And now they're quote unquote correcting a problem that never existed in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's my reading on it. Your reaction. Uh, your, your reading uh, is from the book that uh, is perfect. <laughs> it is a well-written book. It is well-researched. Uh, the analysis is on point. You know, clearly there was no election fraud that was, that was found anywhere. But, you know, hold up, though, because Arizona's still trying. <laughs> yeah, Arizona, Arizona don't count so those votes. Nothing, right? You know, but you know, the the whole thing is, you know, folks. I, I I guess I put it like this. You know, don't deal with a philosophy that says if you're trying to fight a disease, drink Clorox, put some Clorox on bleach in you. And that'll that, that'll just sort of flush everything out and clear out all the all the messed up stuff that's there. It, it's it's idiot it's idiotic. It's idiotic. You know, we know that there was no election fraud. We know that the more people vote, you know, the saying that I like to use is that when America votes, democracy wins. That's all that we're saying. Let America vote. Don't don't stifle the vote. You don't need the cheat to try to win. You know. Win on your merit. You know, most of these, most of the members of Congress and most of the members of the state legislature, many of them, are athletes. Win on your merit. Win on the court. Don't cheat. Win on the merit. Follow the same rules. Don't cheat. Don't cheat. That's all we're saying. Don't cheat. Don't cheat the American people, because when you cheat the American voter, you're cheating democracy. Don't do it. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to think of any uh, athletes in the Republican Party right now. Well, you got the congressman in Utah used to play football, Owens. Um, I'm trying to think of any other. I, they don't seem very athletic, uh, but maybe maybe I'm <laughs> maybe I'm overlooking somebody. Uh, uh, there are a couple of marksmen in the bunch that are very proud of their uh, marksmen. 
their shooting abilities. I just want to go back to something you said. I wrote it down. I liked it so much. Uh, the internal inconsistencies of of the Republican or the excuse me, uh, I, well, I call it MAGA, but their position. And this one that I always uh, it always gets me, uh, Daryl. So I think about uh, in Georgia and in Texas and Florida and Wisconsin, Michigan, the Republicans they want to make sure that voters have IDs because they need IDs, and that's really important. Then you flip the switch. You talk about getting on an airplane with a vaccine passport or getting on a cruise ship. Oh, no. That's an infringement on my liberty. <laughs> you just can't require me to have a vaccine passport. What is it now? Do you believe in the va- in the IDs, you know, and licensing, or you don't believe in it? They're all over the map, Daryl Jones. <laughs> that's, but that's that's the that's the problem with you know that conservative philosophy is that it, it's just internally inconsistent, much like racism is internally inconsistent. It, you can't really make sense of it. It's like how can you possibly be pro death penalty and be pro life? Pro death penalty. I, I want to kill you, but I want you to be alive. Yeah. No, come on. And it, it, it's very clear, I, I, either you're, you know, it's too many mixes. It's, it, it doesn't make sense. What does make sense in terms of the voting world is that, you know, protect the right to vote, let everybody vote, and let it be fair. That's all. That's all. And, you know, I understand it's tough to win if you have a losing philosophy. You know, get a winning philosophy. <laughs> right. I mean, that's the answer. Get the winning philosophy. Yeah. Don't stop people from voting. Get a winning philosophy. Yeah. Well, that it's now that that gets into uh, uh, yes, where the Republican Party is right now, and and I think a lot about uh, Senator Scott's rebuttal to Joe Biden last night, which in in so many ways was very revealing, uh, because they got a black man uh, to stand up and say, America is not racist. Mm-hmm. And after he talked about how he he used his black identity to sort of give himself credibility on this one, Daryl, it was a very interesting what he did. He goes, I've been followed in the past. I know what it's like to have been followed, but America's not racist. And so I, I was like, what? <laughs> were, were, were they racist? Was it, wait, when they followed you, was it racist? I don't get it. I mean, it, 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 does that no longer exist? So a young Tim Scott today in South Carolina is not going to get followed? I'm trying to understand where he's coming from. And I get the sense that the Republican position on matters of race is that we're not a racist country. We have nothing to apologize for. We have nothing to change. We have no reason to change anything. And the Daryl Joneses of the world uh, are just race baiters for trying to get voting rights laws passed in Georgia. Uh, so just ignore them. To me, that's the message that he was delivering last night. Your thoughts? You know, again, uh, it, he was just so full of the internal inconsistencies. I mean, all of it was just, you know, okay, let's, let's forget about slavery. That's just, it, it didn't exist. It did, it did. Oh, no, it happened, but we're past it. <laughs> right. Let's, let's forget about the 40s and the 30s before the 1960s, okay? Before you had any protection in place. Uh, okay, okay, well, let's forget about that. Let's forget about the 60s. Let's, let's forget about uh, all the things that have happened to suppress and to put in place racist structures, and I would have had a heart attack if he had used the word systemic racism, right? That he was acknowledging that systemic racism exists and a, and, a, and a deep understanding of it. Because if you believe that the systemic racism still exists in institutions across America, then America is still racist. That, and those are the internal inconsistencies that are there that, that you know, just jump out as I listen to him talk. and. It just doesn't make sense. If he's trying to move an effort forward, it didn't happen last night. Mm -hmm. One of the things, you know, I'm a litigator, right? I'm a criminal defense litigator. One of the things I tell uh, people that I represent is this. You know, I'm before a jury. I need to keep all my credibility, 
with the jury. Because if I lose credibility with the jury, they're not going to believe anything I said. And you're going to jail, <laughs> right? So I need to keep my credibility with the jury. What Tim Scott did last night was that he lost credibility. He lost credibility. And so I don't know how he regains it. But at this point in the African-American community, uh, the, the credibility that he had has been lost. And the question will become for him, how does he regain it? But that's not my issue. You know, my issue is being certain that the folks that are in the community at large have the opportunity to vote fairly. And that's what my focus is at, at this point in time, because I truly believe, and people uh, have all, often asked, you know, uh, why, why are we so uh, pushing so hard on this? I'll tell you why. You know, voting goes down ballot. You know, it's not just about a president. It's not just about a senator, U.S. senator. It's not just about a member of the House of Representatives. It's about the judge that sits on that local court that is elected by the community. It's about the chief of police who is appointed by the mayor or the county executive that was elected by the community. So that's the basis of it. That's the foundational basis of what we're after. And that's the reason that we push so hard to be certain that the access to the ballots ballot is uninterfered with, that it's not impeded in any way, that there's no three-card Monty going on, <laughs> that, you know, you, you thought you're supposed to go to this polling place, but they moved you to another polling place. By the way, they do that in Texas. <laughs> They'll yes. switch your polling place and not tell you in the black community, so you don't, you're in the wrong place to vote and you don't know where to go. That's what it's all about. That's why we do it. All right, that was a great riff, Daryl Jones. Uh, by the way, if I ever get uh, pulled over in trouble in uh, in the state of Maryland, I'm, I'm keeping that number. Uh, the first number I call, criminal defense lawyer, Daryl Jones. Uh, all right, we're going to close with a little talk about uh, statehood. I'd probably bring you back because this could deserves a lot more time. I've already devoted uh, one show to it, folks. If you want to check it out, we had this uh, the shadow senator from D.C., uh, Paul Strauss, on uh last week i think it was i'm losing track of time and the shadow senator just think of that term they don't even have a real senator they have a shadow senator who gets like the shadow <laughs> the other senators <laughs> i mean you can't make this stuff up america <laughs> but it's not a racist society anyway um he's the shadow senator just think about that for daryl for one moment okay we'll move on uh talk a little bit about uh, the issue of statehood uh, for dc yeah, you know, uh, the District of Columbia, uh, people ask, you know, they say it's such a small area, it's, it's, a, it's a little town, you know, why, why should it have statehood? Well, it's larger than at least four other states that exist in the Union population-wise. So in terms of whether or not D.C. Deserve, deserves statehood based on population, that's, an, that's a non-argument. It does. It does. If you look at just what's standing there now, it does. It pays its fair share. It pays its taxes. It deserves to have the, have the ability to be self-represented and, and to have uh, uh, members who can actually cast meaningful ballots, and it should be the 51st state of the United States. They, it's well-deserved. I mean, anything that... Can you imagine living in a state and the state that you live in is controlled by the 50 other states? <laughs> right, right, right. You can't make the decision, but the other 50 uh, uh, folks around you, mm. they're going to make the decision for you because you're not bright enough to be able to do it for yourself and be able to manage yourself and to be able to manage. Come on now. No, uh-uh. The District of Columbia should be the 51st state. They're, you know, Again, their tax base is higher than many other tax bases for these states across the country. There's no reason for this not to happen. It, it's a no-brainer other than it's a matter of control. It's a matter of control. Let D.C. become the 51st state and control its own destiny. Yeah. And uh, so how close is that to being a reality, in your opinion, having D.C. as a, a, its own state? I think that uh, it's relatively close. Uh, you know, as, as you know, it's through the House, right? And then we're going to go to the, the most difficult fight, which will be uh, on the Senate side. And... <sighs> One of the things that we're also uh, addressing and, and want to have addressed is the filibuster. Because we don't want to get in a situation where we have substantive rights, whether it's D.C. statehood or voting rights, that get sidelined because of the filibuster. So we've got to address the whole filibuster 
issue. And that's one of the other issues that, that we raise on, on, with our May 8th campaign is addressing the filibuster and what should be done. You know, what is the solution uh, that is available for it? Because there's, it, it's wrong for uh, a very small portion uh, of Congress to be able to stop the progress of the country. That's simply wrong. Yeah, no, the filibuster is no joke. And uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, if Joe Biden can figure out a way to avoid the filibuster on the on the matter of statehood for D.C. I know there's some clever lawyers out there who could figure out a way. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the issue, the, the, it, it, will they uh, concoct their strategy, stand by it, find the 50 Democrats they need to vote for it, uh, we will be uh, watching that one and uh, folks like uh, Daryl Jones and myself and a lot of good uh, people, activists throughout the country are putting the pressure on the Dems to do that. So no Democratic senators get those wobbly knees. <laughs> West Virginia. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I got to believe. As soon as I, I as soon as I really was about to say this, Daryl, I was like, oh. God, I'm probably going to regret saying this. I got to believe that in the matter of statehood, Joe Manchin of West Virginia will stand strong. I, I mean, he must have it, it, his re, he gets reelected. He gets elected all the time. He's a former governor of the state of West, uh, West Virginia, so he's pretty popular. But he must have uh, there are black people in West Virginia, and he must get their votes, and he must need their votes. I just have to believe that he'll be with the Democrats on statehood. I could be wrong, Daryl. I could be too optimistic here, but I got to believe uh, on this matter. You know, they just need to, like, this. he needs the excuse, right? Because he goes, I'm never going to be against the filibuster. So they have to come up with some kind of legal gimmick to say, oh, well, I'm not really killing the filibuster. You hear what I'm saying, Daryl? The games people play, as the song says. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, Ben. You know, I'm an old Maryland boy. And so, you know, I have a saying that I use in Maryland. I say, you know, you count their votes after the cast. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't believe what you see and believe what, don't believe what you see until the votes are cast. When the votes yeah. are cast, then count it. But right now, I, I, I'm not counting in any kind of way. And I'll be working out there with the folks in the district and everywhere else to, uh, for D.C. to become that 51st state. Count their votes after they're cast, and then the Republican strategy: if they uh, if the count doesn't come out your way, throw out the votes. Or stop them from voting. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Republicans figured it out. If we can keep black people from voting, we could win all the time. There you go. Uh, let's uh, great great strategy, Daryl Jones. Thank you so much. Uh, you want to give out any last information about May eighth? Uh, any websites that people should go to? Any organizations they should follow? Take it away. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Ben. Thanks for having me. I encourage all of your listeners to go to the John Lewis Day of Action dot org website and find a location that's near you for the voter cade and come on out and, and attend. You know, we can be reached at the Transformative Justice. I can be reached at djones at tjcoalition.org. djones at tjcoalition.org. We, we certainly welcome uh, your participation, your comments, your assistance. You know, John Lewis, dayofaction.org. Please come and join us. All right. Thank you very much, Daryl. Uh, keep up the good work and I hope to have you back on the show sometime soon. All right. Thank you so much, man. All right. That's Daryl Jones from uh, Washington, D.C. or Maryland, I should say. Uh, did a great job. Transformative Justice Coalition is the name of the organization. Before him, Jacob Kaplan, Cook County Democratic Party, breaking down uh, the remapping process in uh, the state of Illinois. Dems are in charge. At least one state. <laughs> Come on, come on, all you moderate Democrats. Don't get wobbly need. Don't get scared, okay? Just because the Tribune and the Sun-Times says they should have a fair map in Illinois doesn't mean you have to do what they say. Anyway, great job, uh, Daryl Jones. Great job, Jacob Kaplan. And, of course, great job, the man, the myth, the legend, the pride and joy of all in Illinois, without whom this show would be possible. And as Daryl Jones, Jacob Kaplan, and the Washington Wizards will all tell you, Back home in Alton, they call him Dr. D. Go Wizards! <laughs> Give yourself a raise. Take it out of petty cash. See you tomorrow, everybody. 
And remember, you can download previous Ben Jarofsky shows, Benny J bonus interviews, and so much more. Over a thousand episodes, chicagoreader.com or wherever else you download podcasts. You can reach us online at Benny J Show, B-E-N-N-Y, the letter J Show, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Send us an email, Show at gmail.com. And you can call us, it's true, 708-658-4788. That number again, 708-658-4788. And hey, if you listen on the download, check out the live stream sometime. Tuesdays through Fridays at 1 p.m., Chicago Reader YouTube. We'll be back tomorrow recapping the week that was in Chicago and or Illinois, and we call it, oh, what a week it was. <laughs>